Sean Haney here with RealAgriculture.com and Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM, joined right now by Carlo Day to the Canada West Foundation. Hey, Carlo, how's it going? Sean, always great to be with you. Those of you that are watching on video, that's a really nice hat there, Carlo. I like that. Yeah, I managed to lift it off of some guy named Sean at a conference in Ottawa, I think, when he wasn't looking. <laughs> very, very comfy looking. Very comfy looking. Okay, Carlo, um, one of the things that wanted to chat with you about today is a, a topic that probably doesn't live in the forefront of everybody's mind on a daily basis, but long term has uh, is really, really critical. And, and that is the need for strategic trade infrastructure. Uh, from your viewpoint at Canada West Foundation, do you feel that Canada is well equipped from a trade infrastructure standpoint going forward? We have the basis, and 10 years ago, we had an even better basis and reputation globally for our ability to move goods in and out of the country. So a decade ago, Canada was ranked in the top 10 of the World Economic Forum rankings on infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure and trade infrastructure. But the last time the rankings were released in 2019, we had dropped to 32nd globally right above Azerbaijan. So you've seen a decade long decline in the perception globally of the quality of our trade infrastructure. And a decade long decline is not one bad harvest. It's not one flood. It's not one strike at the port. It's not one bad winter. It's a symbol of a systemic problem. And we've seen other countries improve their rankings of their perception while we've dropped. So this indicates that no, um, we've lost our ability to manage the long-term investments, the long-term design of our trade infrastructure to make it competitive globally. And if you can't move it, you can't sell it. And increasingly folks are telling us, and just really quickly, just this past week, the World Bank's um, rankings on port efficiency had Port of Vancouver second to last. No Canadian port ranked out of the bottom one third. So we certainly have issues and it's not something that happened last week and it's not one port, um, it's a systemic problem. So the answer is what our competitors do, which is national planning, taking an approach to look at the entire system, which we don't do. Okay. so. When you say national planning, can we actually do that effectively, or does that the, does that just bog this down so it becomes this bureaucratic mess and we don't actually advance? What when we when you say we have to have a national plan, what else has to be wrapped around that in order for us to do that effectively? A, a lot of things, but I would start with the fact that we have a national system for moving goods. We think of the Western Gateway, the Pacific Gateway, or Central Canada focused primarily on moving goods down to the states. But the reality is we have integrated supply and production chains. We have integrated logistics systems that move across the country. The railroads move across the country. If you make changes to one part of the system, it impacts other parts of the system. Businesses trying to move goods out of Western Canada, say timber, are impacted by changes in other assets, road, uh, rail, rail, not just rail infrastructure, but road infrastructure in other parts of the country. The system is linked. And if you look at trying to whack a mole and just put one problem down, you can inadvertently create problems in the other parts of the system. So it's national in that you have the system. And the only way to deal with a system like that is by taking a large view. So national basically reflects a reality that we have an integrated supply and production system, an integrated logistics system where what happens in one part impacts the other. You can use the word national, you can use the word systemic, what, what, whatever you want, but that's the reality uh, of our system. Who has to lead this process? Is this something that's federal, federal government led or is this something that needs to be led by industry taking it to the powers that be? It has to be all parties working together. And we spent 10 years at Canada West looking at international best practice. How do the Australians, the Americans, the Aussies, 
oh, sorry, the Aussies, the Europeans, uh, uh, Malaysia, how do other countries manage their systems? And what you see is a national process led by the, the private, led by the government, but with private sector participation, a private sector voice, a private sector seat at the table. Trade infrastructure, as opposed to wastewater systems or schools or parks, is an asset class of infrastructure where the private sector is often the majority owner, majority operator, majority user. The private sector has unique proprietary business information about how the system works, about how one change will impact other parts of the system. So you have to have the private sector participating. This is international best practice. You also in Canada need the provinces and municipalities at the table. So the government has, you can say leadership role or you can say convening role in bringing everyone together, but everyone has to be at the table and everyone has to participate. Are we are we underfunded? Is is this a money problem or is this an idea or organizational problem? Both, but you can't put the cart before the horse. You need the horse to lead the cart, and you can't spend money unless you know where to spend to get the greatest return on investment. Where to spend where you won't cause problems in other parts of the system? How to do a long term planning process. These assets are 30 years, 20 years, 30 years. You need a process that goes that long. So before you fixate on the money and spend money to potentially make the problem worse, even though you think you're solving a problem, you've got to get that down. But in answer to your question, yes, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development publishes data on what countries spend on inland transportation infrastructure as a percent of that country's GDP. Canada ranks below the OECD average. Uh, we are, of the economies looked at, we're way down on the end of spending well below the OECD average. I think we spend one fourth of what, say, Australia spends, and we spend less than the Americans, and certainly much less since the Americans have up theirs. So as a percentage of GDP, yes, we're down. What that exact figure is, you're not going to know till you have long-term mm -hmm. national planning that makes sense. Okay, Carl, what I don't understand here is how we got to this point. So we have a very vast country from a geographical standpoint. So when we talk about trade infrastructure, we're not only talking about you, you know uh, export markets, we're also talking about interprovincial trade and how some of this infrastructure would actually facilitate a little bit more interprovincial trade if we you know make sure the regulations are are running and humming at at, at the, the proper sync level how do we get to this point with, with us being so trade reliant and you know so much of our gdp comes from exports how how did we let this slip where we're in this position like we are today because the alternative is 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 not really ideal it's a good question you know, we've been so focused on digging out of the hole of uh, the 10 years of research convening that, that we didn't look too much at how we got into the hole. But certainly, when we had the Asia-Pacific Gateway, uh, Canada was ranked in the top 10. When it became clear, I think, to foreign customers and uh, folks in Canada that we weren't going to continue that, when we weren't taking that strategic planning element, that long-term strategic planning element, at least for, for the Pacific corridor, we started to slip a little bit. But I think it's also deeper. We've evolved to reward short-term thinking. We've evolved to reward ribbon cutting, uh, shovel ready. So our report on this is from shovel ready to shovel worthy, how to dig out the hole we're in. Yep. I think we move to that shovel ready ribbon cutting. We reward mm -hmm. politicians and we reward the system that gives us something bright, new and shiny, where we're whacking the mold that just popped up. There is no reward for taking a longer term view. There is no reward for a politician to invest in long term planning for a project where the opposition will cut the ribbon or a politician not yet born <laughs> will cut the ribbon. So we've really, in terms of 
from the government side, but also from the electorate that rewards politicians, we've devolved, I think, into this short-term focus. And you know, shovel ready means that you've admitted failure. Shovel ready means that you haven't done the work to have shovel ready projects ready to go. It means that you're willing to take a short-term boost uh, to, 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 to workers going out over investment. And we've just devolved in our thinking to accept that as a good thing. And if you think about it, it's really bizarre that you could think of shovel ready as being a good thing and not shovel worthy. What do, you, what do you include as trade infrastructure, ports, railways, roads, in, yes. in, inland hubs, uh, rural, is rural broadband a component of that potentially, or broadband in general? Like what, 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 all, what all would you all include in that, in that spoke? So it's a good question. Uh, it, it's one that we kind of take for granted. Everyone has a vision in their head. But if you step back, it's the assets, so the physical assets, and the systems, so information, knowledge, uh, rules, regulations, that move goods, people, money, and ideas in and out of the country. So in Canada, we move a lot of commodities. So our first thought are the systems and assets, ports, also airports, uh, roads, rail that move goods in and out of the country. But in trade and services, uh, it's the movement of people that's very important. Trade and services, tourism, education, uh, financial consulting. That's the movement of people. So you look at the efficiency of airports, ideas, rural broadband, enabling ideas and information to move in and out of productive farm areas or agricultural areas is a component. But obviously for us, the big chunk is moving goods. But as you think about the future of trade, you think about trade and services and moving people, and you think about systems for moving ideas and information. These are all parts of what we consider trade infrastructure. On this topic, are, are the Americans any better at this than us, or are they in the same doldrums of short-term thinking and and missing the, the long-term picture? I think the Americans also suffer from short-term thinking, as do most of our competitors. The, the difference is they've managed to put in place other systems to engender longer-term thinking and longer-term planning. Certainly the investments, the massive financial investments that the, um, the Biden administration is making is going to have long-term consequences. You're talking about serious money um, going out over a long-term period of time. That will, if successful in gender planning, will engender coordination. Um, we just haven't seen the same movement in, the, um, in, in, in Canada. Carlo, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate it, important topic, and uh, we'll conti continue to uh, have the conversation with you. Appreciate it very much. Hey, if I could get one last word in for agriculture, you know, you're not going to solve the individual problems that the agricultural community and producers face until you solve the larger problem. You can continue to play whack-a-mole with rail and other issues as they pop up, or you can have a better chance of solving these issues or mitigating them with a long-term approach. Long-term approach needed indeed. Thanks a lot, Carl. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Sean.